This is a 15-minute vote. The first recorded vote of the day in the uh, U.S. House. It is a previous question vote on a rule that uh, covers the uh, defense authorization bill, the 2012 defense programs bill. More debate on that coming up uh, later on today in the U.S. House. Meanwhile, over in the Senate today, they will shortly resume deliberation on the expiring provisions of the, uh, the Patriot Act and possibly moving that forward later today with uh, a vote there on the Senate floor. Earlier today in the House, in the House chamber, a joint meeting of the House and Senate to hear from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. That's why the little bit of a later start for legislative work today in the House, but the Prime Minister spoke for some 50 minutes, and we will show that to you later on our schedule, and you can also find that online in our video library at cspan.org.
On the House floor, a procedural vote ahead of a vote on the rule that would uh, encompass, that would cover two bills. One, the defense programs bill, the authorization bill for fiscal year 2012, and the other um, would also um, fund graduate, graduate school, graduate med medical education. Earlier today in the House, by a voice vote, they passed a bill, uh, an amended version of a bill that would extend the authorization of small business programs, a specific small business program called the Small Business Technology Transfer Program, which would otherwise expire at the end of this month. That was passed by a voice vote. So more debate ahead, particularly on defense authorization, the 2012 uh, programs bill, and a number of amendments expected on that.
two votes here. First one's 15, a procedural vote. The second one is the vote on the rule, which covers three issues, two bills, one which would change how Congress funds graduate medical school education. The other bill the rule would cover is the fiscal 2012 defense authorization bill. And the bill, the rule rather, would allow for um, same-day consideration of a rule for a bill that would uh, increase, raise the debt ceiling. Now, this afternoon, the Washington Post, Felicia Sondes is reporting that the House is going to vote next week on a measure that would raise the country's $14.3 trillion debt limit without any conditions. It's a move, she writes, by Republicans to put Democrats on record with a vote on a measure that is not expected to pass the House. She writes that a House Republican leadership aide confirmed Tuesday that next week's vote will be on a $2.4 trillion increase to the country's borrowing limit and that no Republicans are expected to back the measure. That's from the uh, Washington Post this afternoon. Vice President Biden has been on the Hill meeting again with bipartisan members on, uh, on that debt ceiling, on the debt and the deficit. No word on uh, how those meetings are going, but we might hear something later on in the afternoon. Again, again ahead here in the House will be uh, more debate on the graduate medical edu education bill, but in particular, lots more debate ahead on the defense authorization bill.
first recorded votes of the day on the House floor. The first one is 15. It is a procedural previous question vote ahead of the vote on the rule that will cover two bills. One would change how Congress funds graduate medical school education, and the other covers the 2012 Defense Authorization Bill, the one setting Pentagon programs and policies for fiscal year 2012, covering all sorts of issues. And uh, Secretary Gates today, in one of his final speeches before retiring next month, the Associated Press says uh, he says he's been disappointed by Pentagon efforts thus far to find budget savings. But he also cautioned that further cuts on the scale proposed by some, including President Obama, will require tough decisions on eliminating some weapon and overseas missions. He spoke today in Washington at the American Enterprise Institute. Another bit of defense news to the Pentagon saying this afternoon that, that the wreckage of the U.S. helicopter destroyed in the military operation that killed Osama bin Laden was returned by Pakistan over the weekend. The helicopter was damaged during the May 2nd raid and uh, U.S. commanders blew it up so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. The U.S. demanded that Pakistan return the remains of the helicopter and Defense Department spokesman Colonel Dave Lappin says it is now back in the United States. That's from the Associated Press this afternoon. Again, more defense debate coming ahead here on the House floor as they consider the 2012 Defense Authorization Bill.
Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes no. Mr. Andrews of New Jersey. Mr. Andrews votes no. Mr. Brown of Georgia. Mr. Brown of Georgia votes aye. On this vote, the yeas are 233, the nays are 179. <clears throat> the previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I, I, the gentleman from Massachusetts on recognized. That, on that, I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. This five-minute vote is on the rule that will cover two bills, one that would change how Congress funds graduate medical education, and the other on the fiscal 2012 defense authorization bill, which has a lot to it. And we spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter about some of the debate expected ahead on the defense programs bill. John Bennett of The Hill joins us. The House begins debate on the annual defense authorization bill. What are some of the issues lawmakers will bring up in the debate? We are definitely going to see a lot of discussion about the Afghanistan war, and I think the broader war on terrorism uh, now that we're in the post-Osama bin Laden era. I've just done a quick count here, kind of back of the envelope math, and I see at least five amendments already um, that are Afghanistan related, mostly by Democrats. You've got uh, a few Republicans signing on here, but all would either call for a significant U.S. troop withdrawal, um, a complete U.S. troop withdrawal, the, the creation of a smaller counterterrorism force, or would put limits on, uh, on, on some of the funding for the Afghanistan war uh, until more troops than are planned to come out this year um, a plan would be set in place to bring out more troops. So the Democrats are definitely targeting uh, the Afghanistan war. They think it's it's time to get out of there. It's too costly, and you know uh, America got oh, uh, got Bin Laden. So they think that now is a good time to pivot and focus on some of the issues uh, back here at home. Another contentious issue is the F-35 engine. What sort of debate will we will we have in in, in terms of amendments for or against the F-35? We're going to see a debate that in some ways mirrors one earlier this year when the House actually, in an earlier version of 2011 spending legislation for the Pentagon, actually voted to kill the second engine program. And you'll see the same debate, that it's um, not needed operationally, that it just costs too much to do two engines right now, especially with um, all the other fiscal uh, problems the nation is facing. But a twist could be added here that may keep the program from being voted down in the House. Uh, the makers of the second engine, GE and Rolls-Royce, have offered to self-fund the engine at least through fiscal 2012. So that would get you well in. That would get you to October of next year before Congress would have to make another hard decision. It's unclear, though, how that's going to affect um, any, any votes on amendments to kill that program. The, the bill does contain a provision written by the House Armed Services Committee whose leadership supports both engines, um, and that would force the Pentagon to create a competition that the Pentagon would get to create if certain things, certain enhancements were made to the primary engine, but that is considered kind of a, a long shot to keep the program alive. So it's unclear what's going to happen there, but you're going to see kind of a repeat of the debate from earlier this year. What about military operations in Libya? Does the bill address this at all? 
It looks like the bill will have an amendment that will be uh, uh, an authorization of force uh, similar to the to the provision in the Senate. It's still unclear how closely it will track with the one in the Senate. Um, but it looks like they are going to do something, and, and this is, uh, you know, it's kind of the easiest way to do a Libya operation uh, resolution by tacking it onto the defense bill. What has Secretary Gates said about the defense authorization bill? You know, he hasn't said a lot outside of the engine, um, and one of the reasons for that is... And he's, a, he's an opponent of this second engine, correct? That's correct. Uh, he doesn't want the... He definitely doesn't want the second engine uh, to be kept alive in any way. He thinks it's not needed and, and too expensive. But I think the Pentagon does like the House authorization bill. Uh, Secretary Gates has already cut a lot. The, the, the White House has ordered some Pentagon cuts, but Secretary Gates, in fact, in a speech today... Uh, has said, and he said this Sunday at Notre Dame commencement speech, that need to, as the defense budget is cut, there's a need to guard the modernization accounts. Those are the weapons programs. And this bill that the House is considering uh, starting today does that. It, it keeps all the hardware and modernization plans of the Pentagon intact. It doesn't really touch any of them. So by and large, I think the Pentagon likes this bill. John Bennett covering the defense debate on Capitol Hill. You can read his articles at thehill.com. Thanks for that update. Thank you. And the rule vote you're watching would cover the uh, debate on that uh, defense authorization bill, also on the bill that would change how Congress funds the um, graduate med medical education programs. Earlier today in the House, they sent back to the Senate an amended uh, version of a bill that would shorten the proposed extension of small business programs. CQ writes that as passed by the House, uh, the bill S-990 would extend the authorization for Small Business Administration, the Small Business Innovation Research, and Small Business Technology Transfer Programs through September 30th of this year. The House passed that by a voice vote. On this vote, the yeas are 238, the nays are 181. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, motion reconsiders laid on the table.
For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? We've got time. Yeah, I told him just to yeah. House will be in order. I'll just start here. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks on the legislation and to insert extraneous material on the bill. Objection so ordered. Mr. Chairman. Sir. Pursuant to House Resolution 269 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 1216. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in committee of the whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 1216, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to amend the Public Health Service Act to convert funding for graduate medical education and qualified teaching health centers from direct appropriations to an authorization of appropriations. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Kentucky Mr. Guthrie and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, will each control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. I rise today in support of H.R. 1216, the health care bill that was signed into law last year, spent over a trillion dollars and empowered federal bureaucrats more than it did the American people. As a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I've been working on legislation that takes steps the bill. gentleman will suspend. The House will come to order. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To take steps to peel back a few of the many mandatory programs that were instituted in the health care law and limit the federal government's unprecedented power. Section 5508 of the health care law authorizes the Health and Human Services Secretary to award teaching health centers development grants and appropriates $230 million from 2011 through 2015. H.R. 1216 amends the Public Health Service Act to convert funding for graduate medical education and qualified teaching health centers from direct appropriations to an authorization of appropriations. This bill is not about the merits of graduate med medical education or teaching health centers. Everyone agrees there is strong need for more primary care physicians in our health care system. But picking and choosing one program over another to receive automatic funding is irresponsible. Making these programs mandatory spending is unfair to all of the other health care programs that have to compete every year to continue to receive funds. For example, as HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelia said during her testimony before the House Energy and Commerce Committee earlier this year, the President's FY 2012 budget eliminates graduate medical education for children's hospitals. While children's hospitals must go through the regular appropriations process to fight for funding, teaching health centers will receive an automatic appropriation. We are $14.3 trillion in debt, and our deficit for this year will approach $1.5 trillion. Congress is making difficult decisions about which programs to fund and which to reduce. We must prioritize, and I find it unfair that some programs are completely shielded and do not have to prove their merit to earn continued funding. Urge my colleagues to vote yes and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The House will come to order. The committee will come to order. The committee will come to order. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Without objection. Ms. Speaker, I rise today in strong opposition to H.R. 1216, legislation to convert mandatory funding authorized under the Affordable Care Act for teaching health centers to authorize funding. The Affordable Care Act authorized and appropriated $230 million for a five-year payment program to support accredited primary care residency training operated by community-based entities, including community-based health centers. 
This training takes place in community-based settings such as community health centers. Research shows that CHC-trained physicians, for example, are more than twice as likely as their non-CHC-trained counterparts to work in underserved areas. Ensuring that that kind of training takes place, which is what mandatory spending support for programs do. It will strength, help strengthen the primary care workforce in, under, workforce in underserved areas, particularly in areas that struggle to recruit and retain sufficient workforce. The Teaching Health Center program supports the training of individuals who will practice family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, internal medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, psychiatry, general dentistry, pediatric dentistry, or geriatrics. These, those disciplines where we're experiencing significant physician shortages. It's hypocritical for my Republican colleagues to take away this funding. They continue to argue that there's not enough physicians to provide care to people who need them in primary care services. This program is designed to help address this very problem, but they keep trying to have it both ways in health reform debate. And this is just another example. Today, the majority is going to say that they have an obligation to ensure this program is subject to the appropriations process due to the need for transparency in our spending process and current budget process. Let me remind the majority that we're not the only party who's directed mandatory funding for programs. The majority must have certainly supported autopilot spending, as Representative Fox described at the Teaching Health Center program earlier this afternoon when they passed the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003, which required mandatory funding for transitional programs. I suppose at that time the majority certainly felt they knew better than the appropriators that the MMA was a worthy program and deserved mandatory program, even though they passed it under the cover of nine with a lot of arm twisting. I can't understand the opposition, particularly from my Republican colleagues. They have repeatedly and inaccurately complained that we don't do enough to promote health workforce expansions, and now they're going to cut funding for the health workforce expansion. Turning the health center program into a discretionary one will make it challenging for these 11 programs that are already made the decision to participate in consultation with key stakeholders like teaching hospitals and their boards and based on expectation that continuing funding will be available. From converting this program to discretionary funding will also deter other entities from making the business decision necessary to expand residency training since funding over the next few years could be subject to the annual appropriations fight. This is yet another political stunt by the majority to attempt to defund health reform. This, this through their playing games with funds dedicated to ensure we have physicians in our country. Several weeks ago, they couldn't stop talking about Medicaid will be greatly improved with the Ryan budget because it provides states with block grants to run their Medicaid programs. How great would it be to eliminate Medicare by giving seniors vouchers to purchase health insurance? And this week, we're busy taking away funds to ensure that we train enough physicians to ensure all Americans have access to affordable care. And once again, the majority has their own priorities. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania two minutes, the chairman of the subcommittee. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the gentleman from Kentucky for his leadership on this issue. Section 5508 of PIPACA authorizes the secretary to award grants to teaching health centers to establish newly accredited or expanded primary care residency training programs. The new health care law, PIPACA, provides a mandatory appropriation of $230 million for this purpose for the period from FY 2011 through FY 2015. You may recall that in the President's fiscal year 2012 budget, he eliminated funding for training at children's hospitals. Because of this, I and the ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, a gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, have introduced H.R. 1852, a bill to reauthorize the Children's Hospital's graduate medical education program for an additional five years at the current funding levels. While the administration couldn't find money in its budget for training at children's hospitals, PIPACA was somehow able to provide a direct mandatory appropriation of $230 million for other teaching health centers with no further action, input, or approval required by Congress. And PIPACA did this with a number of funds, mandatory appropriations. The bill before us today, H.R. 1216, simply 
converts PIPACA's mandatory appropriations to an authorization subject to annual appropriations process, just like the Children's Hospital GME program, making it discretionary. Passage of the bill will also save $215 million over five years. I urge support of the bill, and I yield back about some time. The gentleman from Pennsylvania yields back his time. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to my colleague from the Energy and Commerce Committee, Congresswoman Capps. The gentlewoman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank my colleague for yielding, and I rise in strong opposition to this reckless bill. I cannot count the number of times members on both sides of this aisle have decried shortages in the primary care workforce of our communities and working, often in bipartisan manner, to develop ways to increase the primary care ranks. And yet today, the next victim in the Republican obsession with repealing the Affordable Care Act is a program that does deal with these shortages. It increases our primary care physician ranks and trains them with special expertise in serving the community. The bill before us would defund this program, taking many qualified Americans out of the primary care workforce before they even have an opportunity to join it. Moreover, cutting these training programs would also affect already existing jobs at the 11 community-based entities that have already expanded their programs to train these new doctors. Taking away this funding will force possible layoffs and have a chilling effect on other sites developing this type of program. Yes, it is paid for through mandatory funding, but that is not unheard of or even unusual. In fact, the federally funded graduate medical education program, which has had measured success in strengthening our health care workforce, is a mandatory spending program. The program that Republicans are trying to cut today is simply a complement to this GME program, focused on community-based care and prevention. The choice on H.R. 1216 is clear. If you believe that we do not have a jobs program problem and that we have all the doctors we'll ever need, then go ahead and vote for this bill. But if you believe that we need to create good jobs and the professionals to fill them, that we need more primary care providers, you must vote against H.R. 1216 and protect this very important program. We can't have it both ways. I urge a no vote and I yield back. The gentleman from California yields back. The gentleman from Texas reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will now yield four minutes to my friend from Tennessee, uh, Representative Blackburn. The gentlewoman from Tennessee is recognized for four minutes. And uh, I thank the chairman for the time. I thank the gentleman from Kentucky for his leadership on this bill. You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's so interesting to me. We had a 2700 page health care bill that basically was a government takeover of health care. What we have heard from so many people in this country is, gosh, you know, I wish somebody would have read that bill before they passed it and the former speaker had said we need to pass the bill and then we can read it and find out what's in it. One of the things that many of the people did not like that was in that bill was many of these mandatory provisions that were put in place. Programs that had been on the books for years that were discretionary programs that all of a sudden became mandatory. And the confusing thing, Mr. Chairman, is there didn't seem to be any consistency. As the subcommittee chairman who spoke before me had said, Mr. Pitts had said, you know, you don't uh, tend to children's hospitals in the same way. You don't tend to nurses and technicians in the same way. But here was this conversion from discretionary to mandatory for teaching hospitals, a total of $230 million dollars, over $40 million a year. Now, it doesn't matter if you need the money or not. It doesn't matter if you know exactly where you're going to use it or not. The money is going to be appropriated. It's put on autopilot. It doesn't matter what we say is going to happen with the government if we need to reduce it. They're going to get that money. That is why this bill is so important. You'll notice, Mr. Chairman, that 2,700-page bill, we're able to delete. $230 million of that appropriation, mandatory appropriation, with a bill that basically is about two pages long. And what we do in this two pages is responsibly address what the American people want to see us address. They know that the federal mandates are costing private sector jobs. 
they know that the federal government coming in and taking over health care is talk causing private sector health care jobs. Indeed, we have study after study that is saying we have already lost over a million jobs. It seems like every time we turn around, whether it is our health care delivery systems, whether it is our hospitals, whether it is our physicians' offices, we are hearing about the loss of jobs to health care providers and in the health care sector because of the passage of PAPACA or Obamacare, as many people in our country refer to the bill. Um, one of the reasons we have to go about repealing these slush funds, Mr. Chairman, is because we simply can't afford this. Every second of every day, every single second of every single day, we are borrowing $40,000. We are borrowing 41 cents of every single dollar that we spend. This government is so overspent. We are spending money we don't have for programs that our constituents don't want. And instead of eliminating, what we are saying is, look, let's eliminate a mandatory program and turn it back to what it was for years discretionary so that members of this body bring their discretion to bear on the issues of the day and bring the opinions of their constituents to bear on how this chamber spends the taxpayers' money. Mr. Chairman, it is not federal money. It is the taxpayers' money. This government is overspent. We cannot afford all these federal mandates. It is time to move these programs back to the discretion of this chamber. With that, I yield back my time. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, gladly yield to our ranking member, our full Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Chairman, uh, Congressman Waxman. Mr. Uh, Chairman. The gentleman will suspend. How much time do you yield? Does the gentleman from Texas yield how much time? Three minutes. Three minutes. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Chairman, there was so much misinformation just given out by the previous speaker that it's hard to know where to start. The Republicans have said they don't like the Affordable Care Act, but what do they have to replace it with? They said they're going to repeal it and replace it. What are they going to do about the uninsured in this country, about the high cost of health care, about the people who can't even buy insurance even if they have the money because they have pre-existing medical conditions? We've had no proposal from the Republicans, except in their budget, they wanted to take Medicare away from future seniors by making it a block grant. And they wanted to cut the Medicaid program, which cuts a big hole in the safety net for the poor to get their health care needs, which means people in nursing homes would be dumped out of those nursing homes. But the bill before us now is to stop the program that would train primary care physicians. Does anybody disagree with the notion that we need more primary care physicians? Anybody disagree with the notion that we need more primary care physicians? Evidently, the Republicans do, because as we heard from the last speaker, she wants to make it an appropriated program, not a mandatory spending program. Well, it's been in a, pro a mandatory program in spending in Medicare and Medicaid since 1965. Training physicians should be assured with funding that we can rely on. We can't train a doctor in just one year. Doctors need a number of years where they're going to be assured of their continuation in medical schools. And that's why We've had assured funding through Medicare and Medicaid, and in the Affordable Care Act, the purpose was to train physicians for primary care in community settings. That's what the Republicans want to repeal. And if they can afford it from one year to the next, they'll put in funds. But if they can't, and their mood is to give another tax break to the wealthy, we won't be able to afford it. 
with all the costs to go to medical school and all the loans that are required, we ought to assure spending for primary care doctors. I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill. It's incomprehensible to me why we even have it on the House floor. It's another one of those efforts the Republicans have been putting up to chip away at health care reform. They want to repeal it. They want to chip away at it. But we don't even know what they want to replace it with. And the American people and our constituents are entitled to know, are they just going to leave people on their own without the ability to buy health insurance because pre-existing conditions? Are they going to tell the elderly they're on their own and see who will want to insure them? The gentleman's time them? has expired. I urge a no vote on this bill. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. First, there were, there were a number of amendments. I think over 100 amendments to the uh, health care bill that were offered by the Republicans. An alternative was offered by the Republicans as we voted on that as we went forward. Uh, Block grants, the governors have come to, uh, several governors have come to Washington and have talked about block granting Medicaid to give them the opportunity to, to not just deal with Medicaid in their states, but deal with the other parts of their budget. I can tell you in Kentucky, because I used to be a member of the state legislature, as Medicaid has continued to consume more of the state budget, it becomes more difficult to, to adequately fund higher education tuition rates are going up because it, directly because of the pie of, of Medicaid that's moving forward. We passed medical liability reform, we, which saves the federal government $54 billion, as estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. We're going to have a bill tomorrow to purchase health insurance across state lines to make health insurance more affordable instead of more expensive on those who spend money out of their own pocket, as, as we've seen uh, the estimates for the health care bill. And the one thing about relying on funding for one year, we do appropriations for everything from defense to other things on an annual basis. And I will tell you, there are not people turning down federal money because it says you're only appropriating it for one year. We don't want to commit in a long-term program. But if you buy that argument, you look at uh, what's in the bill. That was, that subject. All we're saying is we want the teaching health centers to be treated equally to other parts of the bill. So if the argument is if you don't do it automatically, you're not going to have anybody participating in the program, which I think is what I just heard, then it does, means training in general in pediatric and public health dentistry, Section 5303, is annual appropriation. Geriatric education and training, mental and behavioral health education and training, nurse retention, 5309 section, Section 5316, family nurse practitioner training, Section 2821, epidemiology, uh, laboratory capacity grants, research and treatment for pain care management, 4305, Section 775, investment in tomorrow's pediatric health care workforce. Uh, so the argument that if they, you know, obviously the argument that was made was if we don't have the teaching health centers on a five-year automatic appropriation, then people aren't going to participate in the program. It, that argument would have to apply to these directly, and I guarantee you I, I'd be willing to, to say without fear of contradiction that people will be f applying for these programs as this moves forward. I reserve my time. No further speakers right now, I reserve my time. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky reserves his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I gladly yield two minutes to uh, uh, a classmate and also the vice chair of our Democratic caucus, Congressman Lucetta. The gentleman's recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman from Texas, from Texas for yielding the time. Mr. Speaker, to put everything in perspective, we're told by the American, American Academy of Family Physicians that today, today we can foresee a shortage of some 40,000 primary care physicians in this country in less than 10 years. Within another five years, that shortage will grow to about 42 to 46,000 primary care physicians. Graduate medical education funds does something very simple. It says to some of these clinics, some of these health care providers, that if you guarantee that you'll make graduate medical training available to our future doctors, then we will guarantee that there will be money behind that training so that there will be a consistency so that medical student can finish training. Well, we just heard that this money that's available to these health care providers, these clinics, should no longer be guaranteed. And so the question you have to ask if you want to become a physician and you're going through medical training 
And certainly the question you have to ask if you're one of these clinics throughout the entire country where you want to train someone to be a family medical doctor, an internist, a pediatrician, uh, a, an obstetrician gynecologist, a psychiatrist, a dentist, a pediatric dentist, uh, someone who specializes in gerontology, you have to ask yourself, if I'm going to try to train someone but I don't have the resources to fully provide the education, how do I guarantee that medical student that I could be there with the funds to pay for that education, to pay them for the work they're going to be doing? You can't. And that's why GME is so important. But we were just told a second ago that this is slush, a slush fund pot of money. Furthest thing from the truth. We're told that the real truth, when we heard someone say, one of the speakers on the Republican side say, we're going to delete this money. That's exactly what's going to happen because if you don't guarantee it, it's gone. And so, Mr. Speaker, the truth is we have to make sure we can train the next generation of medical leaders and therefore I urge my colleagues to vote against this legislation. The gentleman from California's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas